Good morning and welcome to the Adult Day Sunday School class at Clifford Baptist Church. Uh, my name is Clyde Moyer. I'm the associate pastor here and also the teacher of, of the Adult Day class. We welcome you and we thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're going to open with a word of prayer and then we'll jump right back into 1 Corinthians where we stopped last week. Father God, thank you for anybody that's listening and that decides to tune in, dear Lord. We praise you for their willingness to come and share with us, dear Lord. We ask that you would remove any error that I might say or take uh, incorrectly from your word, Father. Teach us truth through the Holy Spirit and keep us safe and directly on path. And we thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Last week we finished on 1 Corinthians 11.30, which says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. This is referring to the fact of many, many people in the Corinthian church were abusing the Lord's Supper, basically. Uh, the Lord's Supper is to be done in remembrance of what Christ did for us, and it's not for any other purpose. Uh, the, the cup represents the blood that he shed for us, the uh, bread that is broken at the meal is representative of his body that was broken for us as well. We were not to do anything other than to use it as a remembrance to remind us of the cost he paid for our salvation. And yet in the Corinthian church, people were getting drunk. They were being gluttonous. They were not taking care of the, each other. Uh, some would come and be hungry and couldn't get anything. Others came and were gluttonous and ate most of everything. And the motive for the meal was horrendously misused. Uh, <clears throat> so this verse is saying that some of them God had allowed to get see sick and weak because of the fact of what they were doing. There are consequences to our sin, uh, some more prevalent and obvious than others, uh, but we need to realize that God sees what we do and understands our motives even more than what we, what we say we're doing. He sees our heart. Let's move on to verses 31 and 32. Uh, those verses say, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Uh, punishment and chastening are somewhat different. Chastening is what a loving parent does to their child when they're correcting them. And when we walk uh, out of the path that God wants to lead us by, then he's going to reach down, if we don't turn around and repent, <clears throat> he's going to reach down and touch us and try to nudge us back into the way. I think maybe a, a, a simple way to put it would be the nudges will get heavier and heavier until we finally step back into the correct path. And I think that's fair. Uh, a loving parent will always do that. Uh, verse 33 and 34 says, <clears throat> Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Again, he's saying be appropriate at the meal. Don't run to the table first and get the best food before anybody else can get there. That's not a loving spirit. It's a selfish spirit. Uh, moving on into first chapter 12, uh, we're going to start with verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. We're starting a new subject here. Um, this is moving into the way that God has created us and how he has chosen to gift us. Uh, none of us are the same, and we're going to take a look at that. And the, just because one person does one type of a job and somebody else does another type of a job, that does not make one better or worse than the other one. Uh, verse 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. The word gifts is in italics in most people's Bibles, and that means it wasn't in the original uh, autograph that the study was done from. Now, <clears throat> what happens is, is, if you've ever taken another language, you know that the sentence structure is different from one language to another. So if you had a, a, a genuine, truly word-for-word -word rendering of the Aramaic or Hebrew or Greek, uh, it wouldn't necessarily make sense in English at all because of the fact the sentence structure is different. So the translators, wherever it was necessary, inserted, uh, changed the order and inserted an English word to make sure that it was understood well. 
to give you an example of the way they can be different, differing as well, the Revised Standard Version, instead of gifts, says spiritual gifts. The New English Bible calls it gifts of the Spirit. The Berkeley translation says spiritual endowments. And the Schofield Reference Bible has a great footnote on this. The Greek word used here is pneumatica, which means spiritualities. So you see that the translators use different English words to describe the, the, the meaning, but they all said the same thing. The idea of translation is that it is to be as close to the original wording as possible. But the thing that's crucial and is supposed to be exact is it needs to mean exactly the same thing. And in order for that to happen, uh, people have to be very, very particular uh, to understand the wording of the time, who was talking to whom, the culture of the time. All of that goes into understanding the idioms and colloquialisms of the local people of wherever that was an original language. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul called, uses a different word for spiritual, and he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. We are moving from the last chapter of dealing with carnalities, things that we're doing wrong uh, in the flesh, to this chapter where we're talking about spiritualities, and these are things that the Holy Spirit gives us in, in gives us a gift of and puts in our heart and our minds it's an ability to do something that you don't have without the Lord um, <clears throat> the modern church needs to do a little more teaching I think on this um, this chapter particularly Paul touches on three subjects the unifying spirit the law of love and the triumph the believer has uh, verse uh, 2 says, You know that you were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Idols were not gods. It is an amazing thing to me to consider the fact that you could take a piece of wood and sit down and carve it out into a particular figure and then decide that was a god and begin to worship it. If I can create it, I'm greater than it. And I sure don't want to be my own god. The, the thought behind that doesn't even make sense to me. Habakkuk, in chapter 2, verse 18, said, What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image and the teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols? That is basically Old Testament speak for saying, How dumb are you? Uh, you just made the thing. You either molded it in the fire or you carved it out of something. And yet now you're going to say it's a god and you're going to worship it? That makes no sense whatsoever. Generally speaking, if something doesn't make sense or seems too good to be true, there's probably a reason for that. It probably is. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. He's moving into the spiritualities and he's saying that in a person's soul, in a, their heart, exactly who they genuinely and truly are, if you're saved, you can't curse the Lord. You're not going to do that. Uh, if you're lost, you're going to have trouble blessing the Lord. You, you would be lip service only. And again, we're not speaking of what our lips are saying. We're speaking of what our heart is genuinely thinking. And that is not necessarily the same thing. You cannot belittle Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. God is not going to ridicule himself. Also, no man can say that Jesus is the Lord by the, except by the Holy Ghost. Now, again, there are many people that, that speak out and say they belong to Jesus or they're Christians or whatever, but their actions don't agree with what they're saying. That's lip service. Uh, it puts me in mind of a spiritual track, a gospel track from way, way back, maybe three decades or so ago, uh, called the longest 18 inches in the world and that's talking about the 18 inches between our head and our heart you can mentally agree and understand something and agree that it's true without accepting it for yourself um, I mentally agree that if I get up and exercise every single day that I'm going to get healthier and get in better shape and lose weight well so far that's been mental and not actual uh, it's the same thing if it's not changing your heart if it's not getting you to change your life, 
something has not happened yet. It's still in your head. Um, the Holy Spirit commands our, our soul's obedience and allegiance to Jesus. One of the interesting questions that I've been asked many times over, over my years of teaching is, can Jesus be my Savior but not be my Lord? Meaning, can I be saved but kind of live any way I want to? Uh, that's actually, unfortunately, a very simple question and a very simple answer. The answer is no. Uh, if Jesus has saved you, then you are his, his child. You, you are a bond slave by your choice of his. And if you're the slave, you do what your master asks and calls you to do. He is the anointed one. He's the king and he's the Lord. Uh, we must obey Christ. Now, does that mean if you're a Christian, you will never fail? Boy, I sure hope not, because that will disqualify me very quickly. Uh, Christians still sin, but they try very, dip, very hard not to make a practice of sinning, and they should be growing in a way, in a direction that's further and further away from sin and closer and closer to the Lord. One of the very difficult things to do is to look at somebody else and decide if they're genuinely saved or not. In fact, a human can't do that. God can. But where I'm going with that is a person that is saved but backslidden looks very much like a moral lost person. And we, we should not judge. We need to accept people as what they say, and the Lord will sort them out. Uh, you be faithful and I need to be faithful in sharing the gospel and sharing the word, and God will take that word and reveal truth unto the people that hear it. Uh, verse 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And then 5 says, And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And then verse 6, And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. We're not the same. Uh, if you were creating a tool and you needed a hammer in order to accomplish what you needed to do, you would not make a violin. By the same token, if you needed a violin to fit a, a place in an orchestra, you're not going to build a hammer. That would indicate that you just don't know what you're doing. God never makes a mistake in the way we're created. Uh, we are created, in my mind, I think we're created perfectly and accurately as a specific and vitally important tool to do something that God has called us to do that no one else will be as good as as we will. God has gifted you, and the giftings that He gives you are not to be viewed as great and small. They're all great if God gives them. And your calling cannot be fulfilled unless you man manifest and work on that gifting. Um, Moving on to verse 7, the, the word says, But the manifest, manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. This doesn't mean profit financially. We as Americans especially, I think, and as American Christians, have a bad habit of assuming that if we're faithful enough and pray hard enough, that we can get God to fit into what we want to do in our life and to, to bless us and to come alongside us and stand with us. That's not biblical. What the Bible says is that God has a plan that is a perfect plan that he had before the creation of the world, before we were conceived or born, and that he has created each of us that are going to accept his son as a part of that plan. We're like a puzzle piece. There's a place he needs us to fit exactly. In other words, we fit into God's plan for mankind. God doesn't fit into our plan for ourselves. I hope that makes sense. Uh, that's what your gifting is for, whatever it is. Um, a gift is basically and very simply just a manifestation of the Holy Spirit within your life. Uh, God never calls you or any of us to do something that he hasn't gifted us to do. If he calls us, he will enable us. Uh, if you are trying to do something and you're determined that's what you're supposed to do but nobody ever really responds to it you're mistaken uh, we need to be open and honest and objective and ask for God's guidance as we look at what we're doing let the Lord show you if you are supposed to be doing a particular thing if you aren't move on to the next thing and let the Lord lead you to where you where you belong 
Verse 8 says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Now wisdom means insight into the truth. Uh, knowledge means to investigate and dig into the truth. Just because somebody has a wealth of knowledge, a, a built up of facts in their mind, that has nothing whatsoever to do with wisdom. Uh, wisdom is knowing what to do with the facts that you have. So those are two different gifts. Uh, verse 9 says, To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Uh, faith is a substance of things hoped for, and that is a gift. Some people have a gift of faith. Uh, the, another is the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, and that means the sick are healed by the prayer of that person who has the spirit, gift of faith, the laying on of hands. What many people have mistaken, I think, is to assume that a gift of healing means I can go to the hospital and start at uh, room number one and then just pray for people, and by the time I get to room 120, all of them are healed. I don't believe that's what that is at all. I believe the gift of healing is given to a person very much like a person as a postman. Uh, now, a postman does not write the letter. Neither does the postman decide who gets the letter. God will decide who he wants to, to, to heal physically, and he will give you the gifting to go to the person he leads you to and pray for that person. So you have no control over what is sent or who gets it. You just carry it from point A to point B. That is really, I think, a much more accurate description of what a gift of healing is. Verse 10 says, To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. The working of miracles is to do supernatural things. Prophesying is declaring the word of God, the will of God. Discerning of spirits is uh, the ability to kind of sense and see things as good or bad or, or see the reality of it as to where they're coming from. Not everybody can do that. I have found, and you might not agree with me on this, but I have found that through my wife and other ladies that I know fairly well, it seems to me that women have a much, much uh, more developed sense of what's going on around them than men do. Um, it seems like uh, my wife can walk into a room and, and she understands that somebody's upset with somebody by the time she's three or four steps into the room. If it hadn't bitten me on the ankle yet, I don't even notice it. That's a discernment. That's something that God gives you. Gentlemen, when your wife says, I don't know if that's right, I don't think that feels right, be careful here. You need to pay attention. Uh, when I have not paid attention to that, I've usually lost somewhere along the line. Uh, verse 11 says, But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. God gives you the gifting that he needs you to have. And what he has divided amongst, you shouldn't be jealous of someone else's gift, and they shouldn't be jealous of yours. You shouldn't look at someone else and say, well, their gift is much greater than mine. What you should do is to thank the Lord for what he's giving you. Do your very best to implement that gift and to help people around you, and God will bless you in that. Thank you for listening in. Let's close with prayer. We'll start right here next week. Father God, thank you for today. I ask that you would bless us and remove any confusion from our hearts, Lord. Correct any error I might have said and let it not be remembered. I ask that you would touch each of us with a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit teaching us the Word of God. In Christ's precious name I pray. Amen. Thank you.